Okay, thank you so much. Um, we're uh, so excited to be here. Uh, first of all, I would like to ask you a little bit about uh, your background and what your organization does. And if you could briefly tell us uh, what do you think is the value of identity in the European context? As you know, there's a lot of innovation happening in the European context in identity. Well, first of all, thank you and nice to meet you all. Um, very briefly about myself, I'm uh, helping uh, companies to harmonize services uh, in the European markets. I'm representing the European Blockchain Association, which is an um, association uh, including different members, apps, layer two, layer one service providers in general, which uh, deliver services over, uh, over blockchain infrastructure. And we help them to be compliant, to help to, to be compliant um, whenever they need to deliver service on the market. Um, the real value uh, for identity Europe and digital identity in the context of Europe is, in my mind, on one side, a regulatory anchor to the IDAS regulation, of course. Europe has a unique story to tell, I would say, um, because identity is something which is very fundamental of a specific, re specific region of the world as Europe, which is um, acting of different member states, which find uh, um, unique common rights in a very core principles, and, and, and identity is one of these. So um, when it comes to enabling digital services from the real world, digital identity becomes very central. Perfect, thank you. Hold on. You come forward. Yeah. Yes, go ahead, Joaquin. Yeah. So Joachim Schwerin, Principal Economist in DG Group, the European Commission, and the unit that is responsible for the digital transformation of industry. I'm responsible for all sorts of blockchain, crypto, token applications for the real economy and any kind of policy aspect related to that. That goes also to the financial sphere, payment systems, etc. I worked on Mika, Digital Euro, everything out there, but also, as said, on the real economy use cases. The technical aspects, uh, standardization, skills, uh, identity, you name it. I think in terms of uh, digital identity, for me, there are two approaches towards that. I think the, the one we heard in the panel before us, and that is the IDAS, what I would still say is the top-down approach. So that's actually a starting point of a European public service in a way. You have 27 member states, you have traditional systems, not too much is online, not too much is compatible, so you try to find solutions to make it compatible fulfill the regulations, etc. That might be interesting to some people. It is not interesting to me. Uh, I am more a person that truly believes in a decentralized Web3. For me, identity starts with the view that we have on individuals, actually, in the digital space, uh, starting from the GDPR, starting from our uh, digital strategy. For me, individuals are nothing, because at the end of the day, an individual is a composition of different parts that engage with communities. It becomes meaningful if you engage in a community. That's where basically the data flows emerge. Uh, that is where I would say also the issues uh, we are discussing here emerge. And then it's a question of, let's say, total flexibility as regards to what you would like to be your digital identity. Is it still an individual identity? Is it a collective identity? Is it a human identity, a machine identity, a not disclosed identity yes. whatsoever? So fundamental questions related to that, which I think for the future will be much more important. But in the short term, indeed, we are more focusing still on the top-down approach. So my, my name is Ivan Marin. I work for, for Blake on business development. So a few words about myself. I mean, the streaming is over. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, a few words about myself. The, I've been working in the IT industry for a number of years now. I have to, I've been working in cybersecurity, ethical hacking for several companies, large companies, uh, transcontinental companies. It's been a great opportunity for me to know also the identity space. I've been working in the Atarena for, uh, let's say, 10 years now, from CAs, TSPs, and now from Glaive. Just a few words about the Glaive. Glaive is a Swiss foundation, a not-for-profit Swiss foundation, and we are bringing digital identity to different businesses or legal entities in the world. It is very ambitious, it is a very ambitious world, and we are working on that. 
So what we provide is a 20D code that identifies uniquely all the companies in the world, accessing to different business registers. So perhaps for you to, be, to bring you some background about the story of the Glaive, after the 2008 Lehman Brothers crisis, maybe you remember that crisis of the subprime, um, the G20 and the FSB, for, uh, Financial Stability Board, decided to set up several measurements, several tools and mechanisms to avoid that to happen again, or at least to be alerted on time to, to correct or to avoid the crash of the economy. One of the measurements they, and the decisions they made was to, be, to, to create the GLAIF. GLAIF stands for Global Legal Entity Identification Foundation. So that's our mission, that's our vision, to provide a digital identity to all the businesses in the world to track all the, all the finance, financial operations they may do and to be transparent on that and to support all the AML, AML anti-money laundry activities and collaborate with us, with those. So that's the intro. Perfect. Uh, thank you so much. If I could stay with you, Ivan, uh, what initiatives uh, within the DID space is, is Glyph currently working on uh, that you can tell us about? Well, within the DID space, we, as I mentioned, we have created the LEI code. Uh, the LEI code is a 20D code. It's a string that you can read. It's 20 digit uh, random random number that is created on, on by a computer, but all the data behind that number is retrieved from business registers. So what we are doing in that space, so we cannot deliver that openly over the internet, obviously. So we, we have created several standards and ISO standards. I can tell you the numbers if you want, 17442 and so on, and many others. <coughs> but uh, uh, mainly speaking, we can embed the LEI codes into the data certificate, so, so we collaborate with TSPs and CAs, not only in Europe, all over the world, just to promote this, uh, this action, to provide an extra layer of security and digital identification. And, and more important, in the last two years, we've been promoting very heavily the digital and um, verifiable credentials. We have created what we call the VLEI, verifiable credential for the LEI, and it's assigned to individuals in co in that who co co work with or collaborate with uh, legal entities. And that's what we are promoting heavily, the use of the VLEIs, the verifiable credentials, within the European wallet and or, you know, in other regions of the world. Perfect, thank you so much. Now, Joaquim, what you said earlier, I think it's so refreshing, right, to hear from a person that works at the EU Commission about the importance of the sovereign individual and privacy. I really appreciated that. Uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the EINES initiative and what's coming up in the next uh, few years uh, in regards to this? Uh, it's interesting that you start a question with being positive about the decentralized part and then asking only about the centralized part. But, uh, <laughs> into, uh, into I'm happy that you mentioned the verifiable credentials. At the end of the day, the Commission has done a lot of work in the context of the IDAS, the EU wallet, etc., and on certain actually real economy uh, projects like the anti-counterfeiting blockchain infrastructure we're working on, which is a sort of de facto digital product passport, and I come to that in a second, that all uses these uh, similar systems. It is still a sort of, let's say, more an interoperability-driven approach to onboard all the various national systems to get some consistency in that. We have a lot of use cases across the various policy fields. I mean, imagine that, for example, uh, you go abroad to work for a couple of months and you have to demonstrate that you have all the necessary certificates and social uh, security and insurance uh, documents, etc. So all of that, at the end of the day, is supposed to be in the European wallet. You are the owner of that information, but of course, there's a lot of legal obligations already around now. <coughs> where you are obliged to have that, you are obliged to have a passport, a driver's license, whatever security documents you have, and therefore it's a question of improving that type of interoperability and having a sort of safe type of wallet where all of that is embedded. Now all of that is nice and will be developed further, especially in the real economy when we have as a focus in the next five years what I just said on the digital product passport as such. It's basically a document that will be related to any type of document that is uh, a product that is produced the moment that it starts and comes into existence. It needs to be proven that it has a specific identity and can keep in a traceable way the identity when it moves through the value chain, when it is transported, imported, etc. That can include information on what type of product it is, but also, for example, to fight child labor, uh, forced labor, deforestation, uh, 
fulfilling chemicals requirements, all sort of that information can be on that passport. It needs to have an identifier, and of course the big question is um, how can you ensure that not all the uh, sensitive business information gets to grabs for everyone involved, so it has to be very closely secured and it has to work basically like a sort of COVID passport when it passes the frontier, it is green or it is red, but that's on a need-to-know basis for people to know. So that will certainly be a priority uh, around. But let's not forget that this is, in my opinion, uh, perhaps the smaller part of the stuff that we are discussing. By saying this, I have not talked about Web3, I have not talked about the machine-to-machine -machine economy, I have not talked about autonomous transactions on smart contracts by whomever, DAOs, all these aspects here, which is fundamentally different. And I think we must distinguish between a situation where you have an existing legal obligation already right now to have your data accessible to public authorities for the type of documents that I mentioned, and there's a clear legal base to do that. That also, in a way, applies to traditional finance in, in the banking sector, when you open an account and you have all this financial obligation. All of that exists and is acknowledged. But I think the more interesting thing where a lot of evolution is happening in, in the decentralized space is now actually when you are not already visible, when you are not already engaging in a sort of regulated activity. Imagine a DAO that basically we could form a DAO here, we could create on a common belief system, we could create a sort of payment system where we tokenize anything, we could even have financial transactions, no one outside knowing anything about that, and why should they know anything about that? But even we could have an interest in having a sort of identifier, uh, which would be part of the code in order to make us uh, put us in a better position to trade with any other sort of strange animal that is out there. And I think that is a very important uh, way forward to discuss because that is at the discretion, discretion of the people in the decentralized space of what they do. That if we decide to scale and engage in an activity that is regulated, that is the point in time when we have to comply with regulation, when we have to prove uh, who we are and what our identifier is, which is, I think it is wise, even regardless of how decentralized you are, to think in these terms. But that would be a sort of overarching system on digital identity, which again is based on those principles that we have been discussed, fully protected by CK proofs or any other means you have. Because that's, that's perhaps something also that I would like to mention in this regard here. If you see things around, like what we're discussing and what has been discussed on EIDAS, on the EU wallet, etc., people, and we know that from studies in Europe, massively distrust public wallets. And for good reasons. If I look at the national implementations of public wallets uh, right now, especially in Belgium here, it is basically a sort of mixture of your most private information where you have no assurances whatsoever actually who has access to that. For example, when you look at MyGov in Belgium, you have your tax declaration, your medical statements, your police record, your whatever document, it's just on the same interface and they tell you, okay, uh, certain things, certain parties don't look at this. When you read uh, who is onboarded from the local administrations, you see tens of thousands of uh, organizations that are there. And you can trust that or you can't trust that. I don't trust that. And that's a point yeah, where yeah, I think yeah. trust has to grow generically in a way that is also related to how you would like to deal with that information. So where it is mandatory, okay. Where it is not mandatory, I think you have to make, make a damn good use case for people to be incentivized to, let's say, use their identity in this specific way. And therefore, it's the same with the digital euro. I mean, central bank tells you, okay, uh, we have a ledger, you have an account with us in a specific way, but we don't look at your transactions. Do you believe that? Okay. Uh, so there, there's a more fundamental issue here where I think um, a convergence from both directions would be nice, but that also requires a movement. And if I look, last remark, on the Europol report that was uh, published three weeks ago, where actually, and I don't publicly comment Europol, otherwise they put me in jail, but um, if, if you looked at not only obfuscation theories and mixers and coin joints are suddenly a problem, but they actively say now that zero knowledge proof is a risk to public security, uh, then you know where that is coming from. And this is something where, I mean, very happy to discuss the efficiencies of EIDAS and the EU wallet, etc. but for the future, this is completely the wrong way to go to move. Wow, so, so many interesting <laughs> things to parse there. Wow, yeah. I would say. <laughs> I mean, yeah. So many uh, uh, activities that we also as citizens need to carry out to advocate for zero knowledge proofs to be adopted, right? Yeah. And to protect our, our data by being sovereign. 
Uh, I'll say though, if, if I can just keep the three hour line in the Brussels airport with a digitized credential, <laughs> I'll be happy. <laughs> Uh, okay, Eugenio, perhaps you all are also on your side, what initiatives are you kind of thinking about in, in this space? Well, um, I think that uh, I would like to start from something that uh, Joachim touched very briefly, which is the digital part of passport, and uh, probably the European blockchain service infrastructure, because I think uh, one of the value propositions of Europe as in the European institution is to be potentially the trusted registries of the trusted registries for European citizens, right? Because they have rights to to have rights on European citizens. So I think there is a strong value on uh, the project called the FCI, um, especially whether it can add in the context of um, working on a verifiable credential out of the scope of the IDAS credential itself. And um, in that way to build um, um, a user journey that can help uh, different off-chain identifiers to collect the specific requirements to build an on-chain identifier which have a strong per permission to access many services on-chain. So um, I think that uh, this is more or less a vision for what EPSI could look like in the future. And uh, now there are big, big talks also in terms of this new European project called Europium, which uh, may see different member states uh, collaborating with APSI and um, if we ask me what's possibly happening in the future considering all these um, these uh, projects collaborating together is that I would like to envision a more equitable way in which different administrations across the European Union they can establish a common framework to share data across administrations and to share in a, in a way that is a little bit more balanced between uh, a bottom-up and a top-down approach, based on uh, the trust that uh, SSI can bring in. Okay, it, now going back to Joaquim there, uh, you did mention that uh, DAOs, uh, you know, as potentially a form of legal entity in the future, is that being discussed in the European Commission? Is that actively, I mean, as, you, as far as you can tell us, right? That's from my part of priority. I mean, um, I'm currently uh, working on a study together with a very good team of contractors. Where happen to be part of that, but also a couple of other people, a uh, small group. But we really want to uh, take the next step because what we've done so far in the digital domain is we have re uh, low hanging fruit. And that also includes financial regulation. Financial regulation at the end of the day is very easy. What we've done basically with Mika is we've taken Mifid and we put a layer below that and we've touched the obvious thing where you have the intermediaries and where you don't have the financial instruments but something below that, etc. We have said very clearly that DeFi is out, it's a big discussion, DAOs is out, etc. But the point is that when it comes to true decentralization, that's really where the hard questions come. What is decentralization? What is decentralization at a certain point in time and during the lifespan of your product? Is it a technical requirement? Is it a governance requirement? Is it basically the question of an entity as such? Uh, the Danish NCA paper that is very much discussed these days in Brussels very clearly says that the starting point is that you have a legal entity. Now, a legal entity, in my understanding, also is something that is prone to an identity because if something is a legal entity, it obviously has some sort of identity, whatever way it is coded. But we know from the real economy uh, legislation and regulation that entity is a relative concept. If you buy a car and if you go to your car dealer, you obviously think that your car dealer is an intermediary. But in terms of competition law, for example, it is not. If a car dealer has an exclusive uh, dealership or a selective dealership, and we have different concepts on that, basically it forms part of the producer's network. So in that sense, you wouldn't say that the intermediary is independent. It is form of that group. And also a lot of other things apply that are, I think, very clearly regulated in the real economy, but completely differently in the financial sector. And that's something which is causing a fundamental problem. So the question of what is actually a legal entity is completely unclear in a way, or at least completely inconsistently regulated across uh, sectors. And that fundamentally applies when we come to also what you are being discussing on the identifiers, because we had that discussion before a couple of uh, Yes, and um, even in the most regulated domain where you have the big corporations there, we have all sorts of different types of identifiers. You have VAT numbers, you have all sorts of other stuff, etc. Even there, you can't agree on many things, not specifically globally. The nice thing now about what we are talking uh, is in, in Web3 
at the end of the day, regardless of where you come from, if you are a business person, if you are a lawyer, if you are whatever, we talk here about code. And if code deals with any form of entity whatsoever that has any form of identity, it means a series of numbers. Yes. So there we have basically to agree on a sort of standards of in terms of codification, what we could consider a form of identifier that then basically ideally serves all sorts of purposes to be horizontally consistent and that's the big challenge ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I, I see you want to react to Absolutely, that. yes. For the reference, thanks, thanks, for, that's why, thanks for commenting that. Indeed, in life we are very focused. Where this year we are celebrating our 10 years of oper life operations and we are very happy and proud of that. And we've been live for 10 years and growing consistently. And what you just mentioned is absolutely true. We need consistency and an agreement on what identifies a company. Let me mention, to, for being practical, a use case that we are working with. The EBA, European Banking Authority, is the, for those who don't know, the EBA is, is a public body that regulates all the financial operations in Europe and all the central banks all, and all the finance institutions in Europe must report them back on a regular basis and they should send our files in XPR format, so <coughs> on a regular basis. So they are changing their systems. Um, how do they, they do identify the legal entities that they, they must deal with or they are reporting them back? So there's an option just to provide um, user's pass password to each individual in each bank, in each uh, legal entity, financial entity, that's crazy. So they decided to bet for a decentralized system using the VLEIs, verifiable LEIs, with a role. So the VLEIs, the verifiable credentials, that they have three, just only three fields. Name, role, and the LEI code that identifies the legal entity you are working for. Uh, for example, IBAN is the submitter for Central Bank of Sweden. Hopefully, but no. But that's, that's the example. So I can report to the EBA <coughs> Uh, for, or the, I can send the report using my credential, in authenticating myself with the credential, signing the file itself with the credential, of course using a, com a compatible wallet, and send the file to EBA. In that way, using this, this decentralized way of identifying people, they release all the work of dealing with identities, they rely on uh, third parties, like what we call QBI, maybe if we have the time I will comment later, which are the issuers of the VLEI, and it's a very easy way, very efficient and trusted way of doing that. These identifiers not only work in Europe, and they are compliant with the IDAS, we're working on that, uh, they work on, in a cross-border way, so because the LEI records are public, or the database is public, you can access from everywhere in the world, and it's consistent, because the data behind that is coming from different business registers in different jurisdictions, and it's super consistent in that sense. And we are very strict and rigorous in all the procedures and operations to, to make that happen consistently all over the world. And it, that applies directly to Europe in the EBA case. And I'm very happy we're running, we're starting with a few banks as, a, as the pilot. I'm going from 800 banks in the, hopefully, hopefully in by, the, by the end of the, this year, beginning of the next, and extending to all the finance institutions in Europe. That's the use case I wanted to serve. Now, uh, Joaquim, if I was were to say, okay, here's this uh, PLEI virtual, you know, verifiable credential with certain information about the entity, and let's say instead of providing the data verbatim, I use zero knowledge proofs, right? Do you think there's an uh, kind of an, an appetite in the EU Commission to start discussing these forms of advanced cryptography and maybe it being acceptable as long as the cryptography has been vetted by the proper entities in the EU? I think a question of discussion it is anyway. Uh, we now have to see what concretely the mandate will be for the next uh, commission. But I would say if you look at the speed of developments that we had over the last couple of years in terms of dealing with digital identity and the IDAS, etc., it's a meaningful progress. But we are scratching the surface of what is actually out there. The moment that we take seriously what we have in terms of tech, uh, we see that we fall way short of having meaningful solutions uh, relevant for any sort of entrepreneurial activity in, let's say, the Web3 space or the decentralized space. So I think in that regard, uh, what you just 
I asked him what you discussed, ticks a lot of boxes that we have in, in Europe. We are, I would say, very good on encryption. We have the necessary skills uh, to do so. I'm in discussions with a lot of people from the entrepreneurial community, actually, where we have the programmers, we have the people there. Um, we are very strong, I would say, on uh, standardization and interoperability because that's our core business as the European Commission, so it ticks a number of boxes there. It's also important, I would say, in terms of uh, setting the standards because we are quite advanced, although not everything is perfect in terms of crypto financial regulation, uh, cyber security and other areas. But we must see what the future challenges are. And I think the discussion falls a little bit too short if we limit ourselves to the crypto and blockchain space. Uh, we have now a convergence of blockchain and artificial intelligence. We have a massive discussion and a lot of concerns, for example, in the European Parliament about uh, the threat by quantum computing, because they suddenly all realize that they are making the same mistake that they did with Lehman Brothers and the financial crisis uh, at that time. Hopefully it doesn't happen again. I can't give you a waiver that it doesn't happen again. But the, the thing is, I was there at the time saving all these banks from day one and realized, and actually what people forget is that within six weeks after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, we had the Bitcoin white paper. The same moment that the centralized system had its biggest exposure to centralized risk, that it was a starting point of what we now see as the decentralized system. And we are getting in that direction to a certain extent because now everything that is being discussed with security infrastructure and stuff like that is again fully centralized. And these people realize when you have centralized solutions and you have new technological threats that you are probably a victim of a similar systematic risk that has been there before. And the only space, the only space that I'm aware of, tell me guys if I'm mistaken, that has solutions already to, let's say, the if you consider that the threat or not from quantum computing, breaking up and encryption, is the decentralized space. There are in the Ethereum space and in other areas, meaningful discussions on ways forward on how we actually can ensure that our systems work, even if the computational power is massively increasing. But that takes time to go through. So the answers to actually the most centralized threat lie in a decentralized approach from bottom up. And that starts with basically finding the semantics, finding with the language, finding, uh, finding coherence on what we encode as regards to how in the future we will see the digital space. The digital space is not really something that you see, for example, when people are asking, where do I see a DAO? Sorry, you don't see a DAO. The DAO is just there and does certain stuff. And um, what I find amazing, actually, and I don't want to, to bore you with that little side remark, is uh, I worked, and we had an event on that yesterday, on this uh, cooking book for decentralized blockchain solutions at DAO from Project Liberty. I don't know who is aware of that. You should read the report. It's, it's really interesting. And I was sitting in the multi-stakeholder uh, council, and a couple of my co-council members, basically, are some <coughs> very strange people that actually keep themselves busy thinking we are somewhere in outer space in a spaceship, and we encounter something else where we don't know what that is. It hopes it has a certain intelligence, and we need to interact with them and find some rules where we can basically have a meaningful interaction. Now, that is the same thing that you will in the future have in Web3. You are a DAO, you are somewhere digital, you find something strange that has just some layer on top uh, where you don't know what is behind that, etc. And you have to find a meaningful way of communicating with that thing and perhaps engaging any exchange of value or whatever you do. And that requires uh, an agreement on the most simple standards that we have. It's like these nice people that sent out Voyager 1 into space for the really old ones among you, where basically they had this plate where they uh, engraved, uh, let's say, a male and a female at the time, it was relatively easy, and then a couple of standard things and a little bit of music for people in outer space to understand what we humans are. And that is what we have in Web3. The starting point is identity. And that is where we need to have an agreement on actually if we start a communication and normally we say our name or we look into faces, we don't have that in Web3. So what is my identity? And there I would say we are having a very meaningful discussion, but I think you probably understand from what I'm saying that this is a very thick piece of wood that we're actually starting to uh, approach from, from, from one side that will take a lot of time. But it's our responsibility as policymakers not to shy away from the fundamental questions. And I find just the traditional approach of having a regulation and after five years thinking, well, do we change three commas and add another paragraph and stuff like that, <laughs> that is not the world in which we are living anymore. Yeah, I mean, I think especially, right, uh, like with DAOs, these are new forms of social organization that were maybe previously not available. 
uh, and you, you don't necessarily have to uh, view them in the traditional lens of, of other forms of organization before. So it is interesting that you know we adapt the regulation appropriately to, to recognize the nature of this. Now, uh, Eugenio, uh, we, we had a, another topic uh, about uh, SSI systems, right? We are talking about hybrids off-chain versus on-chain. Can you maybe like dig into that a little more? What are the two approaches, how they can coexist? Okay. Well, um, I would try to answer this question from uh, um, my personal perspective as a user, right? So we have been speaking here that me as a user, I would probably interact with digital, different digital services having different identifiers, right? So these uh, identifiers need to talk to each other according to possibly different uh, principles or needs that I have, right? So um, security, privacy, composability, usability. So according to this, uh, I think off-chain identifiers and on-chain identifiers should talk each other to have a seamless digital service experience for the users, right? So, and this is essentially the difference between the two models, right? So if I have on, if I rely on off-chain identifiers, I choose to adhere to a more strict principle to support my privacy, support a more um, security environment of my digital interaction. And I decide maybe to use a glue acting as a, as a cryptography using ZK to share only this minimal information which allow me to build a, a sort of a proof storytelling on chain that then will allow, allow me to do different on chain services. Um, in one transaction, multiple transaction, however, um, this is irrelevant, uh, the, the interaction would be anyway correlated to the requirements that are needed to interact with different applications. So I think that they are not two separate models. They are the same. They just, uh, I mean, from, from user perspective, they address different concerns and they should collaborate each other. So a consistent uh, digital <coughs> identity offering should uh, live on both environments, I would say. And uh, well, instead on the other side, on market perspective, this is also going towards the trends of uh, having, uh, of course, much more users in the networks, uh, to having different kind of networks that needs to collaborate each other, layer tools which focusing more on usability and onboarding users and transactions, and the layer one which uh, in, instead needs to address more security reasons and privacy at the most. And here, again, this is a confirmation, the creation of um, aggregation networks that can combine different proofs, different ZK proofs, uh, expressing different um, uh, ownership requirements which are crypto cryptified. So um, I think the evolution of the, of the technology have given the users much more options from what we have in, the, in before and uh, the evolution between off-chain and on in going towards on-chain identifiers and from, let's say, monolith uh, network to modular networks are an explanation of the evolution of the market needs. Okay, super interesting, yeah. Uh, now, Ivan, going back to you, uh, you, you told us a little bit about how Glyph operates. Uh, can you tell us more about the governance framework and the vetting process and how this relates to privacy for, for companies that use the, the framework of Glyph? Yeah, absolutely. So Joachim has mentioned very, uh, very important thing is to, simpli to simplify, not to be simplistic, to simplify the access and to unify the understanding of how we identify digitally um, different entities, in our case legal entities, as we are working with different businesses all over the world. So if you realize, uh, when you retrieve the data from a company, you may think, well, it, that's easy. I access to the business register, I get the data, and done. But it's not so, sim so simple. Because if you look at Germany, they have more than 20, 30 business registers. In Italy, you may have one. In Spain, you have one. Portugal is different. You may, you may have a couple. So even within Europe, we don't have a uniform way of retrieving data truth, reliable data, trusted data for businesses. Therefore, we have created, as uh, Soto has mentioned, a vetting process and a governance process 
to do that. We have what we call uh, QDIs, qualified VLI issuers, that are those are our, our operational branches who are in charge of retrieving the da those data from different business registers. In the, so we introduce or we set up an ab abstraction layer that allows you to just co uh, re uh, do a query to, to Clay, ask for a business and, re and get the, all the data around. Regardless the specialized access in different jurisdictions, even within Europe, that, that we may have. And that's what we have set up a governance framework, a very strict qualification process for those, legal, for those entities who want to become a QBIs and what we call LOUs, local operation units, um, to, to issue the LEI codes. So the LEI codes are very useful for the cross-border trade. When you, when you think about cross-border, it's not only among different countries in Europe, also for trading with China, Korea, India, wherever, US. So and the that's the governance, the governance we have set up and the qualification process. And within that governance, we have introduced, we have created a, a very strict vetting process to make all the data reliable and trusted and verified. So that's what we what we have. Okay, perfect. And now for closing words, uh, just what excites you with the future of uh, you know digital identity in Europe? Uh, maybe some closing words from each of you. I'm personally very excited about travel credentials. You know, anything that gets me through that three-hour line of Brussels airport, I'm all for it. Uh, I'm all for mobility. So I'm really looking forward to that and seeing how that standardizes. And I think uh, the EU also has a very wisely chosen open standards over uh, what you know other proprietary uh, kind of. Uh, options that are out there, uh, and I really like the fact that it's a verifiable credentials based, uh, as opposed to what you know the U.S. states are like, kind of using the ISO format. So verifiable credentials, great to see. But uh, maybe a little bit from each of you, what excites you? Well, um, I can say may, maybe a little bit more on a high level, a general general level. I would say that uh, what excites me about um, the future for digital identity is that if you are able to build like this solid bridge between off-chain and on-chain world, then we can really establish, uh, according to some of the concepts that were explained even uh, this morning, about a concrete gateway for different Web3 services. So digital identity can be really the alpha case for uh, the blockchain space, the uh, Web3 space, as Gen AI has been for the AI model. I would say that the exciting thing about this topic here is in relating to what actually blockchain is, uh, technology that brings us back to the basic DNA of humanity that is self-organization and the way that we would like to see ourselves acting in the world. And the nice thing also about the digital space is that uh, it is big enough to have any form of identity and norms that you would like to have. That's for you to decide who you are, with whom you are, what you do. Every one of us has their views on the world, but in the digital world you can basically be what you are. The interesting thing comes when you engage a set in activities that are regulated, then you have to find an onboarding mechanism where actually your identity needs to be not only known, but also be understandable. You need to be reachable for the requirements that exist there. This onboarding is a very interesting uh, point because what we do with the verifiable credentials in a way opens up the opportunity space. We have a lot of different documents where you have this, this once for all onboarding process and then once you have the green light basically you need never again to disclose your identity because you have your credible uh, number, your credible identity and then you can go on. Of course the key question is who will onboard you and what will happen with that information that needs to be very much ring fenced. But I think if you think that system through, then actually you will probably go down from three hours to three seconds if you go through the air. But if you are that fast, which uh, I'm not really sure, because then it will only flash green and you go through. But of course, that again raises a lot of questions. What if it was red? Is it a technical error? Is it something else behind that? Tons of questions to be uh, discussed. But I think what is, is truly fascinating um, is that uh, if, if you look into human history, you see that wherever societies emerged, also what we now see as, as primitive societies, they have found very different ways of 
organizing themselves, but they have extremely aligned structural similarities of the functionalities of what they are doing. And this is what we are getting back in, in this space here. It all looks very different, it looks hardly comprehensible, but it is very often completely aligned in terms of the functionality. And on that we have to have a social agreement on what we are actually finding important as a society and then again let loose. And that is the hard part, but the moment we've done that, and I think the the young generation, the four billion gamers, everyone who grows up organically in this space has a much better attitude and openness already to these things and finding these solutions. We elderly ones are a bit slightly detached from that, but um, we have some exposure to that. But in 20 years from now, what we are discussing here will be the norm. We just have to figure out how we get there, what we will get there. So finally, as a closing remark from my side, so digital identity, what is exciting about digital identity for businesses? Well, uh, internally we have a project and we call Galaxy Project because we want to provide dig uh, digital identity to all the businesses in the world. That's our goal, that's what we want to do, that's what we've been working so hard for the last 10 years and moving forward. And we call that project Galaxy because the world is not enough. We want to provide identity to all the businesses we find around, even beyond our frontiers. So that includes the Brussels airport, okay? If you need, okay? Just to, to speed up your onboarding. So, but basically, we, we are providing an abstraction and a layer to simplify the digital identity, how you identify digitally all the businesses, not only for simplicity, also for clarity and for doing a clear business for, for everyone as a public good. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you.